Hello, welcome to the James Cooley Show. It's your life. I'm your host, Dr. James J.C. Cooley. And uh, wow, we got an absolutely fantastic show coming your way today. I mean, we got this guest that's been on the show a couple of times. I call her the young professor, and, you know, because she's always doing great things, always educating and always just, uh, you know, up, inspired and just 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 want to help everybody out. But before we can get to the guest, I got to always uh, introduce my absolutely fantastic executive producer and co-host, Dr. Michelle Cooley. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. We're here in Atlanta. Woo-hoo! We're in Atlanta, just celebrating, spending time with family. And, um, you know, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited that you got here safely from California. So I'm yeah. happy about that. <laughs> I'm glad to Long be here. <laughs> You know, we're here, and uh, tomorrow I have uh, the pri- privilege of uh, receiving the uh, presidential Obama 44th uh, Presidential Lifetime Achievement Award. And uh, wow, I'm just so uh, so excited that uh, I'm getting this opportunity uh, to uh, receive an, a prestige award like that. But then I want to dedicate that award to all of the great men and women that are doing great things in bringing love joy and happiness to all mankind so that's that's my uh contribution i want to i want everybody to share in uh with that award with myself so but michelle i'm excited about the show today and michelle look like you uh, uh, you, 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 your camera is all the way down where you, you i'm I sure can... it. <laughs> <laughs> okay that's better but uh i'm excited about this guest today uh, uh, just like i said she's been on a, a few times and it just uh, it's been so long since we had her on the show why don't you tell our uh, viewers and our listeners wherever they're watching this that was e360 television uh, YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter, or over 25 other live streaming network. Why don't we introduce the title of the show, the purpose, and introduce this absolutely fantastic uh, guest of ours today. Well, yeah. So the title of the show is called Starting Over, and we're getting to know Desi Carson. She's a mental health equity advocate, business development manager, community builder, social activist, and life coach. We're going to talk about letting go of our past to embrace our future, accepting your past and future selves to accept our present self, and deciding between holding on and letting go and giving ourselves grace through the process. So let's talk a little bit about our guest today, our returning guest. There is no Desi without DEI. Growing up across 10 different states, she found consistency in volunteerism, such as food drives, shelters, teaching sports, Skills to Children with Special Needs, Anonymous Suicide Hotlines, and many more. As you graduating from the University of Virginia 2014, she spent her main career running inclusive recreational programs at UVA, Valdosta State University Adult Sports, on a national level at Zog Sports. Desi became a research assistant in 2019 for the head of psychology at the University of D.C., After conducting extensive research and producing several manuscripts, she shifted her role to become the business development manager for her organization, Psychotherapy. Um, They utilize hair care as an entry point for self-care and equitable mental health access for POCs. You know, there's so much more about Desi that's not even on this page. She's been doing some great things lately. She's has some projects in the works. So we're going to welcome back to the show, Desi Carson. How you doing, Desi? How you Hello. doing? Hello, so good to see you both. It's been a long time. It's been a minute. <laughs> and uh, I know that you're doing a lot of great things out there, and I can't wait to just let's catch up on some of the things that uh, that you're doing. So, Desi, since uh, it's a lot of a new uh, folks that probably did not uh, catch the last show that you was on, uh, can you tell them a little bit more about Desi, what she is doing, and what inspires you? Yeah, hundred percent. So Michelle already mentioned that I work with the organization called Psychotherapy on one end, and that's where we work for mental health access for people of color through salons and barbershops. And we do trainings and certifications uh, centered around mental health first aid and the history of black psychology and black history as it relates to hair as well. And then my full-time job is with the nonprofit called Ideas Generation. And we do a lot of DEI consulting work. We also have programs available for folks that are just interested in getting into the field. 
And one of the big exciting things that we have going on is that we recently got awarded the Roddenberry Fellowship. And with that, we're actually going to use that seed funding to create our own fellowship uh, ourselves. So we'll have a great pipeline opportunity for folks to come and get trained up on how to be a DEI consultant. And then we actually place them in partner organizations to do the work as well. So it's a lot of really exciting things, um, a lot of coaching opportunities as well. So it's been busy. It's been busy. <laughs> wow. You know, and let's uh, continue to get busy. And I want to thank you uh, for helping me out with uh, putting together the presentation that I had to uh, uh, present uh, earlier this week uh, on diversity, equity, inclusion. Uh, yes, she she specializes in, 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 in that type of presentation, that type of work. So, but this, if you had to pick one word to describe who Desi is and why, what what, what would be the best adjective that, that you would use to describe yourself and tell our, our viewers and listeners why? What a great <laughs> question. Not to be put on the spot, right? <laughs> um, I would describe one word. Let's see. I would say I'm going to say generous. And I say that to say that I find it really important to be generous with myself, to be generous with my time, to be generous with my energy, to all of those around me, to society as a whole. And I'm continuously working on being generous with myself as well. So that's that's a process in itself. But I find it it's it's a really important value of mine to be to have servant leadership, right? To help others as much as possible. And so I'm gonna stick with that word. <laughs> you know, that's that's a that's a great uh address. That's a great word because you are generous and uh you you are doing a lot of things to help others and you know always thinking of others and that's what uh is service before self <laughs> and if we could get uh, a whole lot of more folks uh to think that way uh, i think the world would be a better place right there would be so much giving so much loving so much compassion and we're just able to receive it all it would be great <laughs> absolutely yeah so desi you came up with the title starting over can uh, you tell uh, us why you came up with that title and just explain uh, what you mean by it? Yeah, so it's something that's actually been coming up in a lot of my coaching conversations recently with, with folks that I've been coaching and mentoring. And this process of starting over seems simple but it is actually so hard for so many people in so many different regards. And the thing is, we have to start over so often. We have to, we think about New Year's resolutions or you think about starting a new job or meeting a new partner and starting a new romantic relationship or meeting a new friend. Um, you know, there are a lot of things that we constantly have to let go of in order to hold on to that next thing that's available for us in our lives. So starting over is just something that's come up often as a practice and a muscle that needs to be flexed. What about the, the folks out there that are afraid of change and just so accustomed to being in the situation, the current situation, and they don't want to even think about, uh, you know, pulling away from that because change is, uh, they're afraid of it. Uh, what would you tell them? I would say, let's take some time to think about where that fear is actually coming from. If we don't know where our fear is coming from, then there's no way that we could overcome it. We have to spend the time thinking, okay, if, am I, I'm afraid of change in this moment. Am I afraid of failure instead of the change? Am I afraid of being judged? Am I afraid of how I'm being perceived? And in order to move forward, we have to identify the places in which we need support or we need help or in which we need reassurance to move past that fear and move into the place of comfortable change. Yeah, but, uh, you know, still, mindset, mindset is, is, is one of the hardest things to try to convince people that you have to sometimes change your focus 
on certain things and you have to be able to step out your comfort zone and do new things and you have to want to. Uh, but why is it so hard for people to step out of that zone and just make that step forward uh, to uh, experience new things? I think that when we think about the the it's because it's unknown we don't know what's on the other side of that fence we don't know what's over there we don't know if it's going to turn out great we don't know if it's going to turn out bad but the thing is can we put in the effort to reframe our thinking to expect the best out of every situation instead of expecting the worst out of every situation and that makes that's a big difference between those that have a pessimistic outcome and pessimistic outlook on life and those that have more of an optimistic view and you find you hear people talk about i manifested you know i i called into being this measure of success that i'm achieving and there's a lot that has to do with our mindset like our mentality will drive whether that we're going to achieve that success or failure and the thing is the more that we can move away from defining ourselves by our failures, then the more that we can focus on the positive aspects of ourselves and on our lives. Because it's so often that our fear of failure inhibits us from experiencing all the joy and success that we can achieve in any particular moment. But the thing is, failure does not define us. And the good thing is we've gotten over every single thing that we've gone through in our lives already. We've already won. We've already done it. Right. And so, but we don't often remember that. We just think about Oh, I did this wrong. Oh, I did that wrong, you know. But the more that we think about you got through everything you've already been through, then that can be really powerful. Wow. <laughs> well put. Well, well put. And uh, I tell you, we're going to take a station break. But wherever you're watching this at or listening to, uh, if you want to be part of the conversation, all you have to do is go to the comments, ask Desi any questions that you might have. Or just join in on a conversation and say hello. It's your life. I'm Dr. James J.C. Cooley. We'll be back shortly after the break. Noah Dingley here, producer of The James Cooley Show, It's Your Life. And the new audio version of James' book, Country Boy, City Boy, A Journey That Ain't Over Yet, is a must-have. James shares his true life story of struggle and success in America. It's both a cautionary tale and a roadmap to achieving the American dream. Get the new audio version of Country Boy, City Boy, A Journey That Ain't Over Yet, by James Cooley on Amazon.com or wherever audiobooks are sold. Hello, welcome back to the James Cooley Show. It's your life. And uh, I got one of my most favorite guests uh, ever. <laughs> I mean, that's, uh, that's, uh, we're here having a conversation with. And I'm 
name is Desi Carlson. And uh, we're talking about starting over. And uh, anytime, just like she mentioned, anytime a person feels that they have to start over, sometimes the sense of fear, afraid, uh, uncomfortable, all of these things sometimes set in. And um, we do not like change. I mean, most people do not like change. And they would rather stay in a bad situation than to make a forward step and just uh, change the mindset and start over. Because Desi had mentioned something a few minutes ago about every situation you had up to this point, you made it through. <laughs> I mean, so you'll make it through at the only next one and the next decision you have to make. So if you want to be part of the conversation, if you got some input, if you got a comment, just uh, go to the comments, ask Desi or myself any questions that you like. And I promise you, I'll get you on the screen and we'll get to you. Desi, so we talk about why shouldn't people be afraid or starting over? Can we expand on that a little bit more? Yeah, totally. And when it comes to starting over, when it comes to change management, you know, this is something that we run into when working with organizations a lot, is that there is this desire to hold on to the past. There is this desire to hold on to this vision, this image that we have of ourselves in the past that if we let go of it, we're afraid of, well, how do we define ourselves then? How, like, who am I if I let go of my past or I let go of certain things and start over? Um, when we're in thinking about mental health, you know, they say that often depression is when folks are fixated or, or think a lot about their past, while anxiety is um, a lot of times focused on the future and, and what could happen and all the bad things that could happen or things that are um, in our perception. And so if we think about the work that we have to do, it's not just in the present and thinking about how do I make these changes in my life? I also have to look at my past and see what do I need to let go of to make room for this new change in my life? In the future, I have to think about in my future self, is there room in my future? Am I envisioning myself as part of this change or on the other side of this change in order to actualize the future that I want to see in the world that I want to see for myself? It's often harder, this change, when multiple people are involved. It's harder at institutions and organizations when it's more comfortable for us to hold on to our past and all the things that we think that we know. But what we know is that that leads to us getting stuck. Um, we can be stuck as individuals. We can be stuck as organizations. And we don't want to get stuck ever because the world is constantly changing around us. And if we're not changing, we're not adapting. You know, so... Desi, what are some of the tactics that we can use to overcome some of these fears? To overcome some of these fears, one of the biggest things I say is look for the evidence of success before <laughs> looking for the evidence of failure. And that is true for any like mental health consideration that comes up in therapeutic considerations a lot. Look for the evidence that of the all the positive things, look for the evidence that you will find success going forward. Uh, celebrate the successes you've already had that are related to the change that you want to make. Um, identify those places that, that work for you. Identify the pitfalls that got in the way of your change. If we don't understand how we navigate change ourselves, then we're just going to keep stumbling forward anytime a new opportunity presents itself. So actually spend time reflecting on the changes that we've made and the outcomes that have come out of that and what made us successful through those points. Also lean into your peers, your family, your friends, your coworkers. Ask them for accountability when it comes to change. Say, hey, I want to start writing letters to my family every week. All right, I need to tell, I should tell someone about that. <laughs> So that we hold ourselves accountable or else no one's going to know that I even wanted to write letters and that's, that was never going to happen. Um, sometimes we need that accountability more than just what we can provide for ourselves. And then finally, what I'll mention is uh, let's work on destigmatizing the scariness around change um, and move with courage through the field. And I think that makes a big difference because fear 
can cause us to step back and have all these reasons why it makes sense not to step forward. But if we look to sources for courage, for motivation, find your motivational speaker. If it's watching the show and listening to you talk just to get some motivation, do that. But find those motivational pieces to help reframe that fear and step more into our own personal courage. Wow. You know, do you believe that um, by a person setting goals, um, uh, just like what you said, uh, writing letters and this and that, but setting goals long term, uh, short term, immediate goals, all these. Uh, do you think that would help combat uh, a lot of the, the fears because uh, you give yourself deadlines mm. on what you want to accomplish by this period of time? Can we talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so that actually relates to, so one of the exercises that I put people through when I'm doing my coaching is we first list out the goals that we have for our time together. And then we go into actionable steps for each of those goals. And as much as you probably heard of the concept of SMART goals, so specific, measurable, actionable, that acronym is what that stands for. So think about them as time-bound reasonable action steps that you can take under those goals. And then we take another step and we identify what are some barriers or things that can be in the way of us achieving our goals. And then for each of those barriers, I go through and help the folks that I'm coaching to navigate the action steps that they can take to address each of those barriers. So that way, when they walk away from this conversation, they have their goal, they have their action step, They have the barriers that could come up or issues that could come up for them achieving those goals and then action steps in order to address those things. So it's like no matter what's going to get thrown at you, you've already thought about it. You're already ready for it. And even if you didn't see something coming, you're more prepared than you ever were. And that's going to set you up for the most success when it comes to change. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. So so Desi, how can we accept our past and future self in order? in order to understand our present self. So that's something that, you know, some people might hear this and they're like, what are you talking about? (laughs) They're like, I am just myself. I've always been myself. (laughs) Um, But the reality is accepting the things that, because we often carry a lot of guilt and shame with us on things that we've done or maybe that we failed at or that we haven't done well. And those failures or those feelings of guilt, shame, or self-deprecation, we carry those with us and those can prevent us from stepping into our best selves. And those can prevent us from making decisions that are healthy for us as far as moving forward through change. So when I talk about accepting your past self, it's basically accepting all the things that you've ever done, all the things you've ever gotten on yourself about, offer forgiveness to yourself, so that you can step into a new mindset, a new state of being without feeling like you're trying to make up for all the bad things that you did in the past, you know, all the ways that you failed in the past. Because if we're constantly trying to play catch up, then we're not really stepping into our future. And when it comes to accepting our future self, you know, think about when I talk about actualization and manifesting and and envisioning yourself in the future that you want to see, We have to accept that as our reality in order to get there. If we never envision it, if we never see it, then we will never get there. Wow. So you mentioned something that I talk about a lot in in my presentation, my speeches. It's called know yourself, accept yourself, love yourself before you share yourself. I believe that uh, all of those things are intertwined among each other when, when you're trying to make changes. And that that we're afraid because uh, in knowing yourself, I believe you have to be honest with yourself. All of the good and the bad, just like you mentioned, you know, you you identify the pros and the cons of who you are. And once you identify, I'm talking about only you know who you are. Only a person know truly who they are. Uh, So they identify the pros and cons and say, Okay, that's who I am. Then walk and look at the mirror. And that reflection that, that coming back, that's who you are. And if that's who you are, that reflection, you have to accept. You have to accept that reflection, that person, that's who you are. 
Because it's the only one you got. (laughs) It's the only one you got. It's the only person that we can be is ourselves. And that is, I will acknowledge that is way easier said than done. I mean, I have been doing this work for a long time. I've been doing therapy for a long time. And it still takes a lot of work to even think about self-acceptance because it's so natural for us to beat ourselves down to come up with reasons why we can't step into the next phase of our life but the more that we can like you said really accept everything that makes us who we are then we don't have to worry about that anymore it's like checking something off a task list (laughs) you know we can we can let that sit back and free up our mind to be able to have more creative thoughts, to have more, you know, expressive thoughts. When we are bound down by by struggles and stress, then that limits our creativity, our openness, our ability to experience joy and happiness as well. Yeah, and, and, and it will. So uh, when you accept yourself, then you realize that, okay, this is who I am. Then you love yourself. You love that person. You love, that is you. You love that person. And then when you talk to others, when you do things, uh, you're able to be the same person every single day without changing. And that's the beauty of things. And that's when I believe there's a, we are able to accept change. We're able to uh, recreate our mindset. We're able to refocus on a lot of things what what are your thoughts on that yeah a hundred percent it's all related because if think about if there's turmoil at home if there's turmoil with within myself then how can i make any steps going forward how can i help anyone else (laughs) in that moment either we talked about servant leadership or you know service over self earlier as well we don't have the capacity to (laughs) give ourselves if we can't give to ourselves first we aren't able to love fully if we aren't able to love ourselves first now that is so so hard for so many people especially when it comes to mental health and wellness because there's so much messaging that we're not good enough there's so much messaging that we're not doing well enough personally or professionally when there's actually so much that we can do to move ourselves in community with other people, accept the love that we deserve by accepting it from ourselves first. Um, well, I saw that question pop up. Do you want me to answer that too? <laughs> we're going to answer that right after the break. Yeah, so okay. we're going to take a decent break right now, but then when we come back, we got my main man, uh, Clem, uh, Clement Johnson, uh, uh, asking a couple of questions. So uh, if you want to be part of the conversation, all you have to do is go to the comments and Ask this young lady any question you'd like. I tell you, it's your life. I'm Dr. James J.C. Cooley. We'll be back shortly after the break. Really get a chance to know who you are. And once you know who you are, you truly know who you are, love who you are. Love who you are. You're a masterpiece. Love who you are. Love who you were born to be. Love, love me some me. That's what I'm talking about. When you leave high school, you gotta know today or tomorrow, hopefully today, what your plans are. Hopefully, you know, there is no bad decision unless there is no plan. Create, collaborate, commit with confidence. Commit with what? Commit with what? And everything that you do.
Life is a series of circles and cycles, phrases and stages. These experiences teach you the lessons of life. You can either ignore them or embrace them. Welcome to It's Your Life with James Cooley. James is a motivational speaker, author, military veteran, and founder of the J.C. Cooley Foundation. James is here to equip you to strive for greatness and overcome adversity. It's time to get you equipped today for the challenges of tomorrow. Now, here's the host of It's Your Life, James Cooley. Hello, welcome back to the James Cooley Show. It's your life, and I tell you, this great, absolutely fantastic uh, guest of mine is just, just, uh, really laying it up. But she is standard operating procedures every time she come on the show. She always bring a great topic and always educate us on a lot of great things. So if you want to be part of the conversation, just go to the comments and uh, ask uh, Desi any question that you like. And, uh, I promise you we'll get you an answer. So, Des, uh, as we were leaving uh, uh, Clement, uh, Clement Tech LLC, he's asking the question: How would you recommend workforce stress? Uh, what are what what are your comments on that? Yeah, so we have to navigate this a lot, actually, in uh, at Ideas Generation, and how do we help people? navigate through workforce stress, one of the first things that I usually recommend is we need to analyze where that stress is really coming from, because most of the time, it's not about you. <laughs> most of the time, someone else is going through something, there's a systematic issue, or <laughs> or it could be you. But <laughs> two out of three, two out of three, like percentage chance that it doesn't have anything to do with you and that you're just a recipient of other factors that are causing you stress. Then identifying the places in which where can we re relieve that stress and what would that look like for that individual person or for for you if, if this question is for you directly. Because um, I'm kind of thinking of it in terms of if you're managing someone with stress and then if you have stress yourself. So think about what are the things that I could take away from my day to day in order to help relieve my stress in a way that doesn't feel consequential? Or what are the things that I can renegotiate with my manager in order to help alleviate my stress? That's something that we tend to forget sometimes in workplace culture is that we are all humans. We're all grown adults and we can all communicate healthy boundaries with each other in a way that does not take away from our professionalism. And that's a, a big reason why people hold on to that workforce stress or hold on to stress in the workplace is because they feel like they can't they can't do anything about it, that they are bound by the people and the responsibilities that they are that they are responsible for. But there is often more room for negotiation than we think. So can you take a couple hours on a Friday, you know, off early? Can you move, skip a meeting that you know you don't need to be a part of? Can we change a meeting into an email so that we don't have to deal with the stress of having a meeting? You know, there are a lot of different tactics that we can take in order to reduce the demand on ourselves, but we just have to be able to advocate for ourselves. And I want to give this message, if anyone hasn't done it already, advocate for a better working style for you. Even if it's the smallest change, just ask for it. You never know what can happen. Just ask for it. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. So when you are coaching, why do you integrate internal work and just letting go? You know, can, can you uh, expand on that a little bit more? Because it's never just about work. <laughs> we never do this work just in a professional mindset, we are individual personal beings that bring our personal selves into the workspace. As much as we try to say, I leave my stuff at home. I don't like bringing my personal stuff into the workplace. That's fine. But in reality, you are still you. You are still bringing you your behaviors, how you handle conflict, how you deal with communication, how you either advocate for yourself or you don't, the way that you tackle projects. That is all defined by how you were brought up, who you are, how you define yourself. And so it's really important that we keep those things in mind. Um, and so when I'm doing my coaching work, I go through how what are the internal factors that are affecting all the things that are bothering you right now um the things that you want me to help you coach on i'm going to push you to think about 
what your role has to do with that. I'm not here to tell you how to fix things with Stacy. <laughs> you know, I can't help Stacy. I'm working with you. <laughs> so I need to work with you on how to adapt your behavior in order for you to meet your best self. And that means we have to go deep. Wow. we got another question. Steve Taylor is asking, how would you describe your actions on healthy workplace? So when it comes to healthy workplaces, there are a couple of factors that really need to be in place. First is psychological safety, and that is way easier said than done. Establishing psychological safety for folks in the workplace means that they feel comfortable to be themselves. They feel comfortable showing up in however they want to show up within the space. They their perspectives, their opinions are valued and heard. They are part of decisions that are being made for them. Um, they are celebrated, they are honored. There is gratitude flowing throughout the organization. There is joy and, and love. You know, a lot of people like to describe a workplace as a family, and I don't like that. I think it's more like <laughs> I think it's more like dating multiple people at once <laughs> because you have to maintain those relationships. You know, if you don't take them out for Valentine's Day, then they're not going to be happy with you. And in a work in a workplace context, it's important that we that we keep showing up. We speak into people's communication or communication languages. We offer thanks and congratulations and gratitude. We uh, positively reinforce each other in our work. That's what helps create a healthy environment. Think about healthy relationships and you'll have a healthy workplace. Wow. You know, so Desi, how do you help others decide, you know, to let go or hold on? You know, uh, what's, what's the strategy? Uh, let go of everything. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> But let go of most things. Um, you know, if, if we think about, I don't know if you've ever seen the Marie Kondo stuff with the organization and cleaning up your your house, you know, the question, the main question that she asks that's been a, a fan favorite is, does this bring you joy? So when it comes to things that we're holding on to or that we're um, struggling to let go of, it's like, how is this serving me? Is this bringing me joy? You know, for when it comes to, potentially negative things like negative self-talk. If you're one of those people that is always thinking bad thoughts about yourself and always tearing yourself down, my question is, what has that done for you? How has that helped you? How has that benefited you? And if there is no positive consequence, then let's let it go. We have to let it go. Um, and But it's a struggle. It is a struggle sometimes because even some of the things that aren't healthy for us, we want to hold on to because we're comfortable with it and we don't have anything to replace it with. So a lot of times in my coaching work, I try to help folks navigate how you can replace whatever it is you need to let go of with something more positive in your life, because that's an easier transition than just, I'm just going to let go and I'm just going to free fall in not having anything, <laughs> you know, because that's scary. That's scary. <laughs> Well, uh, uh, my main man, Clem, is asking you another question. What is your take on open workspace versus offices? Ooh, great question. <laughs> I First, I'll say I love working from home. So let me just <laughs> throw out that I am a remote work person all the way. <laughs> but other than that, when it comes to open workspaces versus offices, what I would want people to keep in mind is what message are you sending with your physical layout within the workspace? Because an open floor plan, the, the premise or the intention is that everyone is as accessible as possible in an open floor plan workspace. While offices feel a lot more private, a lot more closed doors, you know, you might hear a lot of people say, well, I have an open door policy, but even if there are separate offices, people might not want to take that liberty and initiative. At the same time, with open floor work uh, workspaces, people often find there's too many interruptions. It's too many, too access, like too open, too accessible. Can't focus on their work that much. And so, what I would recommend is that what is the culture of your organization, and how do they feel about privacy and work styles and vulnerability? That's the biggest thing because if they can't uh, navigate through, um, or if, if they can't 
feel comfortable in having, you know, some things behind closed doors, then you might want to have things open and have people more accessible. But if that feels too disruptive, then I recommend providing private spaces for people to work so they can continue to do what they need to do. Wow. Great answer. Great answer. So, uh, Desi, why do you think it's important to give yourself grace when you're making the decision or letting go or holding on and you know why why is that so important because it's hard james <laughs> because because it's so hard and anything that's hard that we go through think about like we need a hug we need a hug afterwards <laughs> you know so and if we don't have anyone to hug us we got to hug ourselves so we really have to give ourselves the grace and space to fail when it comes to change, to fail when it comes to understanding ourselves, but to, like we say, continue to love ourselves, offer grace, remind ourselves that we've gone through everything we've already gone through and that we're going to continue to get through everything we're going to get through. Um, and the thing is, we don't always get those reassurances externally, but we often seek out that validation externally. But in reality, it's so much easier to give it to ourselves, even though it might feel weird, go in a mirror, say some affirmations to yourself, do whatever you need to do, watch the James Cooley show, do whatever you need to do to be able to pick yourself up in that moment. Um, because grace and loving ourselves and forgiving ourselves for everything that we've ever done is how we can release ourselves into the future and into our future self. Wow. You know, uh, Joshua Goldsmith uh, has a question for you, but we're going to pick that one up once we get back from the break because uh, that's a very important question about the remote. Uh, but I tell you what, uh, keep the questions coming in. As you see, she's a genius, like I told you. <laughs> I mean, and, and all, you know, she's been helping so many people and she will help you out as well. So I'll tell you what, we're going to take a station break, but we're going to come back with more uh, Desi Carver. Carson, it's your life. I'm Dr. James J.C. Cooley. We'll be back shortly after the break.
Hello, welcome back to the James Cooley Show. It's your life. And as you see, uh, I got the young professor here. I just, uh, I mean, she have not missed a beat and she never did. Uh, and and uh, she always give you clarity in your answers. And uh, I'm very, very good at what she does. You know, so if you want to be part of the conversation, we, we still got time. We have the better part of 11 minutes. If you want to be part of the conversation, all you do is just uh, go to the comments. If there's any question that you like, and I promise you, we'll get you on the screen. Desi, we got a, another question from Joshua Goldsmith. How do you think employees can maximize the production of their employees that they when they are working remote? Yeah, you, know, you mentioned something about working remote, and uh, I understand what he what he talking about. So, can you explain that a little bit? Uh, I think you're on mute. You're on mute. Yes, and this is something that we address a lot um, in our consulting work at Ideas Generation as well, because our whole team at Ideas Generation is remote. In fact, one of our employees is in Bogota, Colombia. Like we are all spread out across the U.S in in um in that country as well and so when it comes to working remotely one of the first things that i'll say is don't assume that they're not being productive because what that does is create a lack of trust and like anxiety and thinking like what is this person doing if they're not responding to this email within five minutes they might not be online and maybe they're not even working so one thing i would do is to exemplify trust in your employees because if they feel if they if they don't feel like they're being micromanaged or watched every second of every day even remotely then that because that actually causes anxiety and worry and stress for folks to feel like you're constantly being under watch or your productivity might constantly be challenged just because you're working remotely that being said, if you are having an issue with certain employees not stepping up to the productivity levels or putting the outputs that you need for them to in, in the organization, then when it comes to remote work, simply open up the conversation of what is your best working style? If you could work any single way that you want to, I love asking this question, what would you do? And I've had answers vary from, you know, I like to work late at night, but that no one else is working during that time, but that's when I'm most productive. And my response to that would be great. How can we communicate that, hey, you'll be available for some meetings during the day, but maybe you're going to take a break in the middle of your day because you're going to come back and, you know, log on at night and be able to do your work then. And is that consequential to anyone else in the company? Probably not. It depends on the kind of role that you ha have, but you won't know that that person has that preference until you ask that question and open it up for them. Another thing is redefining what productivity and success looks like with your employee. Maybe you have a definition of productivity that doesn't match up with their definition of productivity. So the first thing you do is get on the same page on what that looks like, whether that's actual tangible things or just the time that's being sent, who's tracking it, what accountability looks like, because what you want to be able to do as an employer is not worry about it, right? What you want to do is be able to sit back and have that production just happen. And the only way to do that is if we're setting people up to work in their best space with their best selves, and they know the answers to that. We don't. They know the answers on what works best for them. We don't. We have to get those answers from them. So we have to put some power in their hands and say, what, what do you need? What do you need? I will do my best to accommodate, but what do you need? And that's just a good practice to ask anyone in personal and professional relationships. Just ask people what they need and they would tell you. People will show you who they are. Wow. You know, uh, I just like how you put that. And sometimes a, a person has to know who they are, so they have to do what we call self-reflection. You know, why do you believe that self-reflection is so important? Because no one else is going to do the reflecting for us. <laughs> you know what I mean? No one else is in this noggin right here. No one else is going to be able to think through all those things. You know, you have to do it. It's like the one thing that we cannot have someone else do for us. And it is so crucial because if we're not self-reflecting, we're just like a pinball bouncing around in a machine, just reacting to different things that happen in our lives, reacting to different people and not really taking control of it. We are not pinballs. Let's not be pinballs. <laughs> you know, 
what is the power of self-reflection? I know you said that no one else is going to do that for us, uh, but they have to bring some type of sense of joy and being able to sit back and self-reflect and just think about just your day or yes and on, on things that you might be able to do better or, or whatever. Can we talk about that a little bit? Yeah, psychologically, right? Self-reflection and mindfulness and meditation allows us to not just let our lives pass us by like we're sitting in a car watching trees go by. We're able to actually stop and lock in those moments, those memories, those experiences in our brain by reflecting on it. Think about when it comes to our our memory, our memories are fickle. <laughs> they are fickle. Often they're wrong, <laughs> but the things that we do remember are tied in with the best emotion are and are often validated by other people who were in that experience with us. Like how many times have you sat back and had a great chit chat with someone that you had great memories with and you were just reflecting on all those great times? Is that not a joyous moment to be able to share those memories and communicate and remember it together? Think about that, but doing it with yourself. You're able to hold on to more of your joy. You're able to hold on to more of your happiness because you're locking it into your brain because you're telling your brain, no, no, don't let this memory go away. Don't let this like perception or feeling go away. And what we're also able to do when we self-reflect is to reflect on our mistakes or reflect on the places in which we can improve ourselves and we can make sure to reframe those and move past those and process through the hardest things that we've gone through. That's what makes a big difference. And that can free us from the chains of our past. Wow. That's, we probably got about three minutes um, left in this show. I don't even want to end. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> I miss you too. <laughs> so what are some of uh, the things that you're working, working on for this year? Yeah, like I mentioned, I've had a big focus on, I've been doing a lot more coaching and I do have bandwidth for um, more coaching for folks. So if folks are interested in coaching, they can definitely reach out to me through the Ideas Generation um, website or through LinkedIn personally. Um, we also have our fellowship program that I mentioned earlier, and that's an opportunity for if you're interested in the field, in the DEI field, or you're interested in really developing yourself in that regard. And that fellowship is going to be a really big opportunity. And we're also keeping an eye out for different partners, for people that might want to be mentors or guest speakers or um, help us with the curriculum design, things like that. So those are two really big opportunities that folks can like get involved with us. Or if you're an organization that needs consulting work on DEI uh, principles or want to have an assessment done, then we do that too. So all of those can be ways for us to connect. Wow. What consistently keep Desi Carlson motivated? <laughs> <laughs> oh, what consistently keeps me motivated? Honestly, um, I find a lot of gratification out of just seeing positive results in folks that I coach with and people that I talk to and just relationships that I have, right? Like, for example, this conversation with you is bringing me so much joy and that keeps me going. And the fact that we have people interacting in the comments and that's really exciting. Um, the fact that, you know, I just have to keep telling myself, keep, keep keeping yourself open because other people need to hear it. Right. That's that's kind of something that flows in my head a lot is that someone needs to hear it today. And I hope someone who's listening, you heard what you needed to hear today because it was meant for you. <laughs> wow. OK. Give them uh, your contact information one more time. we got about a minute to go on the show so that they can reach out to to you. Yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn at Desi Carson or you can send me email at Desi dot Carson at Ideas Generation dot org. There's a, you need your own television show. You and I need, <laughs> you need telling to talk, me that. <laughs> we, we need to talk about different because you are so, so fantastic in what you do. And I'm not just telling you that because you're my friend. I'm, <laughs> I, I watch you. So I, I want to thank you so much. You know, you got to open an invitation to my show anytime. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to, to come on the James Cooley Show with your wife. I'd like to thank uh, 
Dr. Michelle Cooley, the exec producer for putting together another great show. Most importantly, I'd like to thank our viewers and our listeners for taking time to tune in to the James Cooley Show, It's Your Life. I want everybody to have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. We'll be back Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, next week. Remember, dream big, think big, and be big at everything you do. It's your life. We'll talk to you later. <laughs>